and the reason we're talking about immunity and the reason I'm making this video here is because we're in the middle of this pandemic, this COVID-19 pand pandemic. And you know, we're told that there's no cure for that and in some ways that's fairly true, okay? There is no cure as in there's no tablet you can take that's going to cure you of the virus and there's no injection as of yet that you can take that's going to cure you of the virus either. But People are curing themselves all of the time, like the vast, vast majority of people who get COVID-19 will cure themselves. And it's their immune system that will cure them. So it's the strength of your immunity that's going to stand to you if you happen to get this infection. And it's the strength of your immunity that will stand to you no matter what infection you get. And okay, you may say, you know, this only affects older people, but you know, it, it doesn't affect all the old people to the same extent. Well over 80% of older people who get COVID-19 are going to recover from it. Well over 80%. So your odds of recovering from this, if you do get it, are very, very high. They're very high. So, and it's your immune system that's going to help you with this. And it's your immune system that's going to stand to you in everything in life, with flus and colds and all sorts of things. So there are things you can do to strengthen your immunity. And eating frozen foods and eating tin foods and eating takeaways and eating stale leftover food and eating lifeless food and eating food that's laced with pesticides and herbicides and all these things, these things are not good for immunity. They'll keep you alive. Fair enough, they'll keep you alive until they kill you, but okay, you'll get by on them. But if you want strong immunity, if you want strong vitality, if you want good health, I just don't think it's possible to be have really, really strong health unless you're eating fairly decent food. Fairly decent food. and uh, But there's lots of other things, as I say, we can do for our immunity as well. So getting a good night's sleep, especially in these times now where we're home anyway, most of us are housebound. So getting a good night's sleep is very, very important. From an Ayurvedic perspective, it's very important to be asleep by 11 o'clock at night time. By 11 o'clock at night time. So if you want to be asleep at 11 o'clock at night time, you have to be in bed by half 10 at night time. There's probably not many people do that these days, but it's a definite Ayurvedic recommendation. We all know the old saying that says an hour before midnight is worth two after. And why is that? Well, in the 24 hour clock, there are two hours within there where the body can get the most advantage from being asleep. I'm not saying there aren't benefits from being asleep at other times, but at these particular times, the body can get the most effective work done. We evolved with the sun. We have evolved with the sun over millions of millions of years, okay? Electricity has given us the freedom to do other things, okay? But like with all freedoms, there comes a price, okay? So generally, most people will begin to feel tired about 10 o'clock at night time. It's a natural thing for you to begin to feel tired. But then we're sitting there and we're watching TV and suddenly something comes on that you have a half an interest in. And then by half 10 or a quarter to 11, you're completely wide awake again and you don't feel like going to sleep. You kind of get a second wind. But so you've missed that little train, okay? So if we go to bed at that stage, if we go to bed at half ten, that's what's called the pitta time of the evening, then these very deep cleansings can, can go on. These very profound things can go on within our physiology if we get to sleep. And then what happens is, is we wake up the next morning at half five, at six, at half six, and then that's time to get up. And if you've been in bed and asleep by 11 o'clock, you're going to be able to get out of the bed at half six the next morning with no issues whatsoever. So getting good sleep is very, very important for your immunity. Not eating junk food, not eating in between meals, eating good healthy food is also very, very good for immunity. Obviously things like exercise, everything affects your immunity. The quality of things that you watch on TV, your relationships, your mental health. Your mental health has a huge impact on your immunity. People who suffer from depression, which we consider to be a mental health issue, and I 100% accept it is a mental health issue, but you'll find the physical markers for depression right throughout the physiology. I don't just mean in your brain where the serotonin levels may be up or down or whatever, okay? But you'll find neurotransmitters associated with that depression in your liver, in your kidneys, in your lung, in your bloodstream. You'll find them everywhere. Because unfortunately, if someone is in the unfortunate situation where they're suffering from some mental depression, their immune system is also depressed. 
And that's why people suffering from depression are more likely to pick up flus and infections and colds and things like this. Because it's not just the mind that that's depressed, it's the whole physiology that's depressed. So our mental state of agitation, our relationships, all of these things have an impact on our immune system. So we need to stack the odds in, in our favour as much as we can. And for me, stacking the odds in your favour, well the number one thing as you all know is TM, Transcendental Meditation. I'm a big, big believer in the power of Transcendental Meditation because I believe when you you know when you have that ability to experience that inner silence that inner intelligence that's inside of you then it's much much easier to make better decisions about the way that you live your life I, I don't think I'd be doing any of this I wouldn't be involved in Ayurveda I wouldn't care about what I ate I wouldn't care about exercise if I hadn't learned TM I learned TM when I was uh, 28 back in 1989 so I think that's the mind is the most powerful thing. If your mind's not in the right place, it's very hard to do anything, you know. So I think the f number one key to health is to get the mind into the right place. When you enliven that intelligence that's inside of you, when you get rid of the stress, when you get rid of the tiredness, when you enliven that creativity, then you make more creative decisions about the way you live your life. I mean, if you're doing anything in your life that's harmful to yourself, well, why are you doing it? Animals don't go around hurting themselves, yet human beings seem to have a huge propensity to do self-harm. And I believe that's because there's a disconnect between the surface level of thought, the daily thoughts that you're having that are guiding your actions, and that inner field of being, that inner genius, that inner soul, that inner field of creativity that exists inside of everybody. You cannot be a human being without having been. It's an essential part of being a human being. So what's being? Being is that field of intelligence. It is that field of creativity that exists inside of us. It's just it gets blocked out. We don't understand what we are. We underestimate what we are. We underestimate what it means to be a human being. If you just take one thing, okay? Every single day in your physiology, 300 billion cells will replicate themselves. That's more stars than there are in the Milky Way, okay? 300 billion cells will replicate themselves. And what I mean by that is the double helix DNA will unwind itself, replicate itself, and you'll end up with two cells. Now, if you took one of those cells and you put it into a Petri dish and you said to a group of top scientists in the world, use some chemicals to make that cell divide itself. They wouldn't be able to do it. You'd be here for I don't know how long before they could do it. Yet you're doing it. Everybody's doing it, regardless of who you are. Everybody's doing that 300 billion times a day, okay? Are you involved in the process? Do you tell your body when to start? Do you tell it when to take a break? Do you tell it when to stop? Absolutely not. That intelligence that's inside of you is guiding all of that. That unbelievable field of intelligence that's inside of you is guiding all of that activity. And you don't even have to think about it. All we have to do is support it. We have to support it and enliven it in our lives. And then we live the true potential of what it is to be a human being. And what a human being is, is we're down here for happiness. We have this stunningly beautiful planet. We have this beautiful world. We have all this, you know, nature and things. And like we're destroying it. We're ripping it apart. And for what? You know? But so... Transcendental meditation to me, I'm going off track here a little bit, is uh, it's one way of enlivening that creativity. And then when we enliven that creativity, we can make better decisions and we can make better decisions about the way that we eat and the things that we eat and, and how we eat. And for me, the second thing I do that I feel is that's important is, is use locally grown organic foods. That's the second most important thing to me after transcendental meditation, after that particular practice, because I think they have far less impact on the environment. I think they're full of life. I think food that has to travel too far or that's canned or that's processed doesn't really contain that vitality in it. Whereas locally grown foods that are grown in season, in tune with nature, that have very low food miles on them and that are not grown with the use of herbicides and pesticides are much, much healthier. And that's one of the things that I would like to see happening is that more and more people go to using organic foods and, and things like that. Okay, so um, I'll just give this a little stir. Okay. 
Okay, so it's not quite ready yet. Uh, don't know what else to talk about. I kind of went off track there a good bit. So what I'll do is I'll uh, put the camera on hold for a few minutes and I'll just wait until this cooks and then I'll come back to you and I'll show you the meal itself, you know. Okay. Okay, I'm back. So one other thing, it's still cooking. Uh, one other thing that I wanted to talk to you about this morning is sesame oil. And given the situation that we're in, I just wanted to give you a little tip about sesame oil. This is uh, sesame oil, okay? Um, but you can get it in any health food store. My advice is to get a cold-pressed organic sesame oil. And uh, as I say, you'll get it in most health food stores. This has very many good, good qualities. And one of the qualities of sesame oil is that it's antiviral. And what I've been doing since this outbreak happened, actually I was doing it before as well, but I wasn't doing it as often, is a thing called oil pulling. And uh, I used to do it maybe once or twice a week, but now I'm doing it every morning at the moment, okay? And oil pulling is where you put sesame oil in your mouth, okay? You just put a, a gulp of sesame oil in your mouth and you swish it around. And you keep it in your mouth and you keep swishing it around for, for between five and 10 minutes. And then after that five or 10 minute period, you just spit the oil out. You can spit it into the sink or spit it down the toilet or whatever, but you just you just spit it out, okay? And this has the effect of cleaning the, the, the mouth, okay? And as I said, sesame oil is, anti, is antiviral, so it makes the, the mouth not a very hospitable place for viruses. Now, I'm not saying to you that this is a cure for COVID-19. Not by any means am I saying this. This is a preventative method. Washing your hands, which we're all being told to do, is not a cure for COVID-19. Social distancing, which we're all being told to do, and I 100% agree with, is not a cure for COVID-19. They're all preventative measures, and prevention is better than cure. And I believe that this is also a preventative measure. And just putting the oil in your mouth, swishing it around for five or ten minutes. The other thing I've noticed is that it cleans your teeth. It, it whitens your teeth over time as well. So I've, no, I've just noticed the other day that my teeth seemed a lot whiter than they had been. So just do that for five or ten minutes every morning. And uh, I think it's a good thing to do. It's a good preventative thing to do. You can also, if you want, put some drops of sesame oil up your nostrils. And then just close your nostrils and breathe in. Just close it over and breathe in. Again, that's something that, that people do as well as a preventative method because this virus gets into you through your mouth, through your nose and through your eyes. So that's why we're all being told not to touch our hands because it get, gets on your hands when you touch a surface and then you touch your eyes or you touch your mouth. You know, it takes a lot of, I don't know, awareness not to touch your, not, not to touch your face because we all do it, you know, so many times during the day, but it's, it's better if we don't do that. But again, stacking the odds in your favor, you can use that, uh, you can use sesame oil uh, to put in your mouth in the morning time. Keep it in there for five or 10 minutes. It actually draws toxins out of the system as well. It's, this has been used in Ayurveda and yogis in India use this, have used this for thousands of years as, as a cleaning method. You can Google it, just Google oil pulling, that's what it's called, oil pulling. And you can also put a few drops uh, in your nostrils as well. And um, as I say, I'm not talking about a cure here. There is no official cure. There is no one thing that you can take. I'm not suggesting that uh, eating this food is going to cure anybody from COVID-19 either. I do know with interest though, with a lot of interest, that over 90% of the people in China who got COVID-19 were treated with traditional Chinese medicine. And traditional Chinese medicine is still very, very strong in China. And people were given soups. They were called immunity boosting and decongestant soups. And they contained lots of different herbs in them, lots of Ayurvedic herbs, including licorice. And these were, I'm not saying these were, you know, people outside of the system. This was completely done within the system. The, the traditional Chinese medicine practitioners were involved in the hospitals. They were involved in all stages of the, of the disease, of the, of the treatment of the disease. And in actual fact, the Chinese government and the Chinese medical professions were jumping up and down about the success that they had with traditional Chinese medicine. And they did certain studies where they, you know, people who had a mild case of the disease and how many of them went on to have more severe cases. And they did studies where people who got the soups and got the herbs and people who didn't. And I think there was a 33% improvement in people who, who got them. And in actual fact, the Chinese, you can go on, I saw this on CNN. There's a CNN report if you just Google it. 
and the Chinese government were and the Chinese medical profession were very very excited about the results that they got from using these traditional Chinese systems of, of, of healthcare because what these things do is they boost your immunity I'm not saying eating garlic or eating ginger or eating anything like that is going to cure, cure you from COVID-19 but at the moment you're relying on your immunity to cure you from this disease so everything that you can do to improve your immunity is should be done and traditional systems of healthcare like Chinese medicine and not, like Ayurveda they've always worked on the immunity they always the central focus of all these things is using things to boost your immunity so that you cure yourself from within okay and we know that this disease can be cured from within and in it, as I say in China you're not hearing that from the World Health Organization you're not hearing that on the six o'clock news that that Ch traditional Chinese I haven't heard it on one official news report that traditional Chinese medicine was was used to treat people with COVID-19 and I mean I know uh, uh, um, causation correlation and causation are, are two different things but I mean the the death rate and their ability to contain this whole thing in China seems to be, you know, a lot better than what a lot of Western countries are doing now. I'm not saying that you can put that down to, to traditional Chinese medicine, but certainly the the medical people over there were very very uh, enthusiastic about what had happened through the use of traditional Chinese medicine. So again, it's about you know boosting your immunity so that you can deal with this but not just deal with this deal with everything because you know what's the next thing that's going to come along you know life throws different things at us all the time and you know the stronger your immunity is the the, the more able you are to deal with all of those things okay i think this soup is going to be ready so uh, so at this stage you want to make sure that the dal is well cooked And then we just okay so that's it oh so that's it that's the soup that's my lunch which I'm now gonna have okay so uh, yeah you all know me anyway so if any of you want any tips or any, if to, you know, you can rewatch this video to see the ingredients and then and everything like that. And if there's any questions that anybody wants to ask me, well, sure, I'll be hooking up with you on Zoom over the next day or two anyway. So I hope you enjoyed it. I'm sorry I probably went on a little bit too much. We uh, managed to cook a soup and solve all the problems of the world at the same time. But anyway, uh, okay, so I'm going to enjoy this and uh, catch up with you soon. Bye.